Okay, could I ask members and those in the public gallery who are leaving to do so, please, as quickly and as quietly as possible. And we'll move on to the next item of business, which is a members' business debate on motion 4082 in the name of Sharon Dowie on marking the 40th anniversary of the liberation of the Falkland Islands. This debate will be uh, concluded without any questions being put, uh, but I would ask members who wish to participate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Ms Dowie to open the debate for around seven minutes. Ms Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is my pleasure to bring this debate to the Scottish Parliament to mark 40 years since the ending of the Falklands War. The war lasted 74 days with the loss of 907 lives, three islanders, 255 British personnel and 649 Argentine soldiers. Both the citizens of Britain and the Falkland Islands owe a huge debt to those who lost their lives. They were defending liberty, democracy and the right to self-determination, not to mention Falkland Islanders' right and desire to remain British. They did this in the face of a foreign aggressor something that feels particularly relevant today. Travelling to a distant land, 8,000 miles away, and as one soldier put it, across an angry sea. It was a plunge into the unknown to defend a people they would never met and, in many cases, knew little about. That is truly admirable and something that we can appreciate collectively as a parliament. Their conduct is a shining example of the very best of the British Armed Forces acting with professionalism, ruthlessness, skill and compassion to bring freedom back to the Falklands. <laughs> Last week, I had the honour of hosting a reception in the Scottish Parliament, along with Richard Hislop, the Falkland Islands representative in the UK and Europe. After the speeches, Richard played a short video made by school children in the Falklands, in which they expressed their thanks to those who had fought for their freedom. It was a touching tribute that affected many of us who were present. The comment that stuck with me most was the wee girl at the end who said, thank you for keeping us British. Things would not have been the same without you. It was a reminder that those who fought and gave their lives laid the foundations for the Falklands of today and their sacrifice has not been forgotten. The video also showed that the Falklands is a changing place, not the 1982 time capsule, which remains in many British minds. For most, thinking of the Falklands conjures up grainy photographs of marines and cagoules crossing a foreboding landscape of penguins waddling in beaches or perhaps the liberation of Stanley in the war's final days. Few in 1982 could have foreseen the dramatic changes which have swept this small but significant territory over the past 40 years. It was clear from my conversations with Falkland Islanders that they have only prospered since the war's conclusion. Both Richard and his deputy, Michael Betts, were eager to tell me about the exciting developments taking place in Stanley, with a huge increase in tourism, not to mention a booming economy that is the envy of South America. If you were to take a walk through Stanley today, perhaps along Thatcher Drive, you would see new houses going up, more fishing boats in the harbour, or the development of a distinct Falkland Islands culture. Britishness with a Latin twist, with their own favourite national sports and food, namely Falkland squid and lamb. The Stanley of 1982 is now, for many, just a memory, just as the war thankfully is too. But these are memories we must preserve. We owe that much to those who fought and lost their lives in defence of freedom. Given more time, it would have been good to delve into the rich connections between Scotland and these islands, or the Scottish role in the British response, whether it was the Merchant Navy sailors or members of the SES. But I suspect others will touch upon this in contributions to come. Before I end, though, I would like to return briefly to the reception I mentioned earlier to thank those who came. Representatives from the South Atlantic Medal Association and Lothian Veterans Centre, representatives of the British Army, Royal Navy and Royal Air Force, not to forget the Governor of Edinburgh Castle, Alistair Bruce, and the Royal <coughs> British Legion members who also attended, or for that matter, Poppy Scotland, who were a great help in organising the event. It was also fascinating to talk to Ian Gardner, a veteran from 45 Commando Royal Marines 
who went on to become an author and military expert writing vividly about his experiences during the war, particularly the battle for two sisters, the fierce night battle that took place 1,000 feet above Stanley. And finally, it would not be a Falklands event without a strong contingent of islanders present, and it was great to invite members of Falkland Wool Growers, the chief islander of Tristan da Cunha, and students from the Falklands studying in Scotland to the Scottish Parliament and learn more about island life from them firsthand. We had speeches from Richard Hislop, who I have already mentioned, as well as Keith Brown, MSP, who has the honour of being the only parliamentarian who served during the conflict, in his case with the Royal Marines, who spoke memorably of his experiences during the war, of friends lost and battles fought, something few of us in this chamber will ever know. To conclude, I would like to thank the MSPs who attended from all sides of the political spectrum. It was touching that despite our differences, I think it is fair to say that we all saw how much British identity meant to the people of the Falklands. What is more, we can all respect the sacrifice made 40 years ago, ensuring that Falkland Islanders remain free from foreign rule to this day. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Ms Dowie. Always good to hear of events that are well attended by Islanders, I have to say. Um, I, we now move to the open debate. I call first Christine Graham to be followed by Murdo Fraser for around four minutes. Ms Graham. Can I sincerely thank the member for bringing this debate? I too wish to commemorate all the lives lost and those injured, both physically and mentally, British troops, civilians, Argentinians. I also recognise the professionalism and courage of our armed forces. In total, 904 military personnel were killed in the conflict, as well as three Falkland Islanders. 255 of those were British military personnel, Argentine 649. British forces reported that 775 were wounded in the war, with 115 captured between April and June. Meanwhile, 1,657 were reportedly wounded among Argentina's military personnel, and over 11,000 were captured. I want to go back to 40 years, because for me, these lives might not have been lost or injured. Before her shot had been fired, pretty well none of us knew where the Falklands was or what the UK government had to do with it. But as I travelled to my law studies on the bus, I recall how horrified I was to hear passengers in front of me cheering that we should bash the Argies. As we came to learn more, we found out there had been an incursion onto the island by metal workers with some Argentinian marines, raising the Argentinian flag, which in turn raised the alert. It was thousands of miles from our shores and had a population in the low thousands. That the islanders were not British citizens, indeed, this was only granted to them after the war. But of course I shared the concerns for their well-being and safety. But I know I was not alone in having grave concerns about launching into a war. The country was not united in the decision to attack and even the way the war was conducted. There was, I believe, an opportunity to resolve the dispute over the sovereignty of the Falklands by diplomacy. It might have failed, but for me it was not given enough time and space. I will indeed. Murdo Fraser. I am very grateful for Christine Graham for giving way. Would you accept that the UK Government at the time made strenuous efforts through the UN to reach an accommodation? and made offers of uh, all sorts of, of uh, proposals of joint sovereignty over the Falklands. These were rejected by the Argentinian government. Ms. Graham, Thank I can you give you the time back. We will disagree about that, but I want to raise... I'm actually going to talk about the issues of the press coverage at the time and how it behaved. The sinking of General Bergeno, an ageing Argentinian cruiser with a loss of 200... 323 Argentinian lives in 2nd May 1982 uh, after it was attacked as it either sailed to or out of the 200-mile exclusion zone, and I don't know the ins and outs of whether what was correct, but it's certainly still in dispute. Well, there was a retaliation, of course, two days later, with an attack on HMS Sheffield, which was sunk off the coast of the Falkland Islands, killing 20 men, and there was no going back after that. But I recall, before even one British ship had sailed, the increased feverish warmongering, fueled in particular by a circulation war between the Sun and the Mirror newspapers. The Sun had a bloodthirsty stance from the start, including inviting readers to sponsor Sidewinder missiles. 
offering free, quote, sink the RJ's computers, and it never relented. The sun splashed with the poster front, front page, we'll smash them, printed over pictures of Winston Churchill and a bulldog. And finally, for me, with the infamous gotcha. Increasingly, the Sun became frustrated with the attempts of politicians, which I agree with, trying to negotiate a settlement, avoiding, as they called it, a shooting war. At one point, US Secretary of State Al Haig was accused of standing in the way of war because of his efforts to avoid bloodshed. The paper even nudged the government to reject an offer of peace talks from the Argentinian military regime with the headline, Stick it up your junta, which became their cat's phrase of the war. But not all the press was like this, of course. For good measure, however, it called the BBC and the Pygmy, the Pygmy Guardian, in quotes, were described by the Sun as traitors in our midst. The Mirror was a, quote, timorous, whining newspaper. And the Mirror, of course, retaliated by saying the Sun had, quote, fallen into the gutter and to the, from the gutter into the sewer. Now, very few politicians, but this language at the time worried me. It worried me the way we were looking at the dangers and the dangers of putting our troops into in war. Very few politicians have experienced the front line of war, excluding my colleague in here. That, those that often speak, and they speak at Westminster too, speak very differently of conflict, and I always listen to them. Dr. Johnson, seeking to prevent an earlier Falklands conflict, said, quotes, It's wonderful with that coolness and indifference the greater part of mankind see war commenced. Those that hear of it at distance or read of it in books, but have never presented its evils to their minds, consider it as little more than a splendid game. And I'm concluding. I return to the lives lost and damaged. They must not be forgotten, and I have not forgotten them. But I have not forgotten how those lives might have been prevented. Intelligence, diplomacy first, and tested to its limits before we put our armed forces into conflicts. Some 1,000 dead and thousands more injured. We owe it to them and their descendants and our armed forces today to exhaust every diplomatic international avenue before ever resorting to the brutality of war. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coon. I now call on Murdo Fraser to be followed by Sarah Boyack for around four minutes, Mr. Fraser. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by uh, congratulating uh, Sharon Dowie for uh, securing uh, this debate on a very important anniversary and join with her and others in recognising and remembering uh, the lives uh, lost, the British uh, servicemen lost, the civilians lost, and also we should recognise the Argentinians lost, because many of them were conscript soldiers who had no a particular appetite for this particular uh, conflict, uh, but were forced into it by what was an evil uh, uh, military junta in Argentina uh, at the time, which was trying to divert away from its domestic problems by invading uh, British sovereign territory. I had the privilege of visiting the Falkland Islands in 2012, on the 30th anniversary of the liberation, along with uh, Keith Brown, who was there, and indeed Christina McKelvey was there uh, from this parliament as well. And it was both a fascinating and at times a very moving uh, visit. And I had the great honour uh, of laying a, a wreath in memory of uh, Cook uh, Brian Easton from Ayleth in Perthshire, who had served upon uh, HMS Glamorgan and uh, had been killed on the 12th of June 1982 when that ship was uh, hit by an Argentinian missile. He was uh, 24 years old. And I know that his uh, former colleagues appreciated uh, that uh, gesture that I was able to uh, perform. Like uh, others in the chamber, I have, I have my own memories of the Falklands conflict. I was sitting my hires at the time. I was 16 years old. Uh, Mr. Carson's nodding. He's obviously a similar vintage to myself. And against the backdrop of um, sitting my hires, I, I well remember the news reports coming through daily of the, first of all, the sailing of the task force and then the conflict in the Falklands. And names like uh, Goose Green, uh, San Carlos, Bluff Cove uh, are still uh, resonant to this day in my memory from that particular uh, time. Uh, unlike many people of my generation, the, the Falklands conflict had a substantial impact on the formation of my political opinions, not least my view of the leadership of Margaret Thatcher and her government at that particular uh, time. There are a number of myths that have grown up uh, around 
uh, the Falklands conflict. And, I mean, Christine Graham made some fair points, but I think, I think she overstated uh, the enthusiasm for war there was uh, within the UK government at the time. I think we have to remember that Margaret Thatcher's cabinet uh, was made up predominantly of middle-aged men who had themselves known war, they'd fought in the Second World War, and they were not enthusiasts for war at all. And the UK government at the time made enormous efforts to try and reach an accommodation with the Argentinians through the United Nations. Yes, of course, Mr. Wood. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, can I thank Murdo Fraser for giving me. Just to go to that point, um, and we can disagree about how the diplomacy was conducted, would he concede that the actions of the UK government before that point in reducing for uh, uh, taking away uh, HMS endurance yeah. Well, things which sent exactly the wrong messages to the Argentinians and some things which resulted in the honourable resignation, for example, of Lord Carrington at the time. Murdo Fraser. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to disagree with Keith Brown's point. I think he makes a very fair point in, in, in recognising that. But uh, I think he, he and others should also recognise that you know, there was no gung-ho attitude in the, in the UK government at the time. They were desperate to try and avoid conflict, not least because of the very substantial risks of sending a task force thousands of miles to the South Atlantic with no uh, idea as to whether that would be successful. If I have time... I can give you the time back. Yeah, Mr. I'll give I think, in, in fairness, you will concede I was talking about the gung-ho attitude of a particular tabloid newspaper, which gave me concern how it came into public. Uh, the public began to own that. Murdo Fraser. I'm, I'm grateful to Christine Graham for that uh, clarity, and I, I, I recognise the point that, that she makes. But there were strenuous efforts to arrive at a diplomatic settlement, and these were resisted. Uh, by the Argentinians, leaving armed conflict as the only uh, way to resolve the particular uh, matter. Uh, so let me just conclude, presiding officer, because I've taken up probably too much time already. Um, I would encourage others who have not been to the Falkland Islands to make the visit. It is now today uh, a vibrant economy and society, as Sharon Dowie pointed out. It is growing enormously as a tourist destination. Uh, you can see uh, wildlife, you can see historic sites linked with the conflict. Uh, 40 years ago. You can see penguins in large numbers, which are always a delight. Um, and uh, I hope we will continue to see the uh, Falklands economy growing and thriving, thanks to the sacrifice that was made by our uh, soldiers, airmen and sailors back 40 years ago. And we should continue to recognise their memory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fraser. I now call on Sarah Boyack to be followed by Alexander Stewart for around four minutes, Ms. Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I very much welcome the, this member's debate and I congratulate Sharon Dowie on securing it. Forty years ago means that for many this is history. But as um, the work done by Help for Heroes, the charity, they remind us that a quarter of those aged 18 to 24 have never heard of the Falklands conflict. Um, nearly one in two of those aged 18 to 34 didn't know in which decade the Falklands War took place. And 11% thought it was the UK invading the Falklands rather than Argentina. So there's something about the importance of this debate going on the record and expressing our solidarity with Falkland Islanders, but also important to learn the lessons going forward. For me, the conflict was marked by the fact that the UK was led by Margaret Thatcher, somebody who I had profound disagreements on almost every topic you could mention. But actually, for me, the exchange between Christine Graham and Murdo Fraser and Keith Brown actually is part of what's important about this debate, because we are a democracy and we can have these discussions and we can look back in history without any of us being put at risk. So there is something about being a democracy that's important. But also to pick up from that discussion, the importance of peacemaking, diplomacy in a democracy, as well as having armed forces. And it's an important principle, I think, to celebrate today that the people of the Falkland Islands, with strong links to the UK and Scotland in particular, were united in wanting to retain their UK characteristics and their links to the United Kingdom. And they relied on armed forces to restore their freedom. But as I think is really important in the motion that Sharon Dowie has put forward, we need to express our support for those who lost their lives on both sides of the conflict, whether they were from Argentina or our own armed forces. Because the, the people who were injured 
also had to deal with the aftermath of the conflict. And that was something that a Falklands War veteran said, not a day goes by where he doesn't think about his experiences in the conflict. And those who were badly burnt when his ship was sunk by Argent Argentine jets 40 years ago. So for many people, this lives on today. But I think we need to also celebrate our links with the Falkland Islands and Scotland in particular. And I want to thank Michael Betts, the Falkland Islands Government Deputy Representative, for meeting me last week. And it was, it was good to reflect on the similarities between Scotland and the Falkland Islands. As, as is mentioned in the introduction, the fact that we have islands in Scotland as well. We have a similar topography and weather in Scotland. Lots of wind power, sheep farming and climate-proofed homes. Uh, sheep are important to the Falkland Island community and they're looking to get recognition to brand as Falkland's wool because it's excellent quality and it's organic. Um, I think there's also important issues in terms of us reflecting on, on climate change as well. The high wind and solar power generation because they don't have an alternative because of the location of the Falkland Islands. And also the links we have between the Falkland Islands and our universities in Scotland and the rest of the UK but also the reliance on the state because of the size of the country and an expectation of, expectation of provision from the state. So people get support to go on holiday. They have a very good welfare system and they have funded university and living fees to enable people to come to the rest of the UK to study and the vast majority of them go home. So it's important that we reflect on the achievements of the Falkland Islanders and our links. We have strong links through the work in the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and our British, Irish and Mediterranean region branch. I started by saying that 40 years was a long time ago and for many it's history. I think it's important that we continue to try and improve relationships between the UK and the Falkland Islands nearest neighbour Argentina. It's critical that respect for the Falkland Islanders are at the heart of that relationship and that we continue our support. Wars are expensive, both financially and in terms of people's lives, and we look to the future. Let us look at the unique opportunity to welcome support, uh, to recognise the sacrifices made 40 years ago, but to look to the future, to celebrate our cultural links, to work together to share our expertise, our academic links and to continue the exploration of best practice between our countries and our people. And let's look at, as we go forward, how we continue to strengthen the links between the Falkland Islanders, between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Black. And now the final speaker in the open debate, Alexander Stewart, again for around four minutes. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to have this opportunity in speaking today and would like to congratulate my colleague Sharon Dowie on bringing the debate to the Chamber. It was not only uh, the invasion and occupation of the Falkland Islands by Argentine forces back on the 2nd of April 1982 was seen as a horrific and illegal act. It also marked a significant turning point for the then United Kingdom government and was the test of the then Prime Minister's leadership and her government. A British Naval Task Force was sent to reclaim the island. However, assembling this force was no simple task. To amass the kind of defence for these islands 8,000 miles from the United Kingdom in the South Atlantic, whether by sea or by air, was going to involve logistics and planning of an epic proportion. The 26 ships, later rising to 44 from the Royal Navy, that took an active part in the campaign were supported by 20 ships of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. These included six specialist logistics landing ships, two ships from the Royal Marine Auxiliary, and there as well as 54 requisitioned vessels. Many of these civilian ships had to be fitted with extra equipment, including helicopter landing decks, a specialist communication apparatus, and water treatment plants for the long voyage. And in addition, the cruiser, uh, the USS uh, Uganda, was requisitioned uh, and converted into a hospital ship. As well as the, the seaborne captivities and the act of air superiority uh, to ensure that was also going to be a monumental task. And while the air tasks were clear and the assets that we needed, they were not clear in any shape or form, Deputy Presiding Officer. Even from the absence uh, of a base at the Ancession Islands and the aircraft that were required to fly to the Falklands uh, and return. They, they had to ensure that air-to-air -air refuelling took part, 
and for the operation of Black Buck, the famous op involving Vulcan bombers from the RAF Waddington that thwarted uh, Argentina's ability to fly over Port Stanley. They are required to be air refuelling. Seventeen times uh, one aircraft had to be refuelled over a 15-hour and 45-minute capacity. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, such a short time to talk on a speech today really doesn't justify any of the significant operations that took place, nor can it come close to acknowledging the significant contributions that were made by so many military and civilian personnel. We have already heard today that the loss of 255 British servicemen, including 15 personnel from our Broth Base 45 Commando and the 2nd Battalion, the Scots Guards, uh, three individuals from the island themselves, uh, amounted to over 900 lives lost in total. So, in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, the British success in this war came about chiefly based on the ability of an impromptu military campaign for which there was no prior planning uh, or projected to sustain any form of task force. And as we know, Argentine forces surrendered on the 14th of June 1982, a date that has gone down in history and with the island themselves in their liberation day. This is a national holiday in Ireland, and as stated by the Falkland Island Government, Falkland Islanders continue to be profoundly grateful for the strong support of the United Kingdom Government continues to provide in acknowledging their choice to remain an overseas territory. The people of the Falkland Islands continue to be forward-looking with a strong sense of culture and a strong sense of heritage. The immense bravery and fortitude shown by Falkland Islanders, the Armed Forces personnel, amidst the harsh terrain and conditions during the conflict should never be underestimated and always should be universally commended. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Stewart. I now call on Keith Brown to respond to the debate. Cabinet Secretary, uh, for around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, uh, and thank you also to Sean Dowie for securing this members' debate to mark the 40th anniversary of the liberation of the Falkland Islands, and also thanks to uh, Sharon Dowie for the sponsorship of last week's 40th anniversary commemoration event held here at Parliament. It was, I think, a fitting way to reflect on the impact and legacy of the Falklands conflict. And I should reflect that, uh, in trying to mention all the MSPs who attended that night, I missed out two, but which I'll try and rectify. I think Pam Gussell and Tess White were there, and I didn't mention them by name. Happy to do so now. I also mentioned by name somebody who wasn't there, which was Murdo Fraser. I don't know where he was that night, but um, uh, I did mention the fact that a uh, has done that he came down to the Falkland Islands uh, in 2012, as I and Christina McKelvey uh, did. And it is um, a fantastic opportunity to see a really remarkable place outside of the Falklands conflict, of course. Uh, back to today's debate, uh, and what is clear from the contributions we have heard is that across the Chamber we are unanimous in recognising the bravery and heroism of all those individuals who, will, uh, say, who set sail to free the islands. I was particularly interested in Murdo Fraser's speech because the young man that he talked about on HMS Glamorgan, who I think he said died on the 12th of June. The 12th of June was the evening between the 11th and 12th of June when the unit that I was in, it's 45 Commando, it's not 45, I know it, there's no explanation for it, but that's just what it's known as 45 Commando. We were conducting that attack, and the person next to me was uh, directing fire from HS Glamorgan onto a position, which scared me endlessly, because the idea that somebody would know exactly how far you were advancing and be able to um, direct their fire with that kind of accuracy, I, I, I thought that it required an act of faith. But it just showed how skillful and brave those people were uh, on the Glamorgan, and uh, my full condolences go to the family, uh, surviving family of the young man that um, Murdo Fraser mentioned. As we near the 40th anniversary, there are a number of upcoming events and activities uh, that will provide all of us with a chance to consider the lasting impact of the conflict. But I'm glad a number of members have mentioned the Argentinians who were involved. And it's been mentioned that many of them were not there by choice. Uh, the ones that I met were young men. One had a, a suitcase. Why you take a suitcase to war? He did that because he had no other way of taking uh, proper equipment, so he took uh, civilian clothes. They seemed to me uh, to be younger even than we were. They were hopelessly ill-prepared. They were hungry. They were cold. Uh, and uh, the one prisoner that I had um, taken back to our headquarters was absolutely petrified. And I have to say one of the major achievements of the Falklands War, for me at least, was I saw no ill-treatment whatsoever of any Argentinian prisoners of war. They were treated exceptionally well in my experience. And that is a mark of a, a very professional force, in my view. 
Uh, I will be delighted to be attending the Scottish National event in Edinburgh on the 18th of June. That has been delivered by the Scottish Government in partnership with Legion Scotland and Poppy Scotland, uh, and will provide the people of Scotland with an opportunity to commemorate this important and poignant anniversary. And I would encourage MSPs of all parties, if they can, to in turn encourage others to come along on that day. And to coincide with this, Poppy Scotland, uh, to go to Sarah Boyack's point, are delivering a wider learning programme and package of resources to schools across the country to allow young people to learn more about the conflict, as well as highlighting the role of the armed forces uh, and the role that they play today and how we can support them and their families. And it is just interesting to think that, of course, back in 1982, uh, we were closer to the end of the Second World War than we are now today to the Falklands conflict. And I can speak for myself when I say, thinking back to 1982, I thought World War II was away in ancient history. So you can imagine how it feels now to be thinking back to the Falcons. I'm also looking forward to attending the Royal British Legion's national event at the National Memorial Arboretum to mark the official anniversary. But I would like to take a moment today to highlight the work done by Andrew Cave to ensure the efforts of dockyard workers who worked skillfully and tirelessly to ensure that our personnel and fleet were ready to sail to the Falcons that they were properly recognised and commemorated. This is the work of Andrew Cave, uh, uh, to make sure they were properly recognised and commemorated with plaques placed on current and former naval dockyards around the world, including just across the Forth in Versailles. And it's only right that we pay tribute to these often forgotten about individuals, along with everyone else, who made a contribution during the conflict, from the serving personnel to their families and the wider communities. I was scheduled to go to an event at Rosyth, which was going to unveil the plaque um, commemorating uh, those workers and the work of Andrew Kay, but unfortunately contracted COVID earlier on in that week. I think we should also take a moment to recognise and appreciate something that we heard last week, which Sharon Day will remember, the strong cultural links that Scotland shares with the Falkland Islands communities to this day. Uh, many of the Falkland Islands population are descended from Scottish and Welsh immigrants who settled in the territory after 1833. And again, many individuals from the Shetland and Orkney Islands presiding officer immigrated to the Falkland Islands in the second half of the 19th century during the development of their sheep breeding industry. Just to turn back briefly to the war itself and its lasting impact, the war involved all elements of the armed forces, lasting just 74 days, claimed the lives, as we have heard, of hundreds of servicemen and had a lasting impact on thousands more, as well as their families. Many veterans still struggle with physical or mental scars or have faced hardships in the years afterwards. And if I could just briefly mention the four men in my uh, troop who were killed, uh, Pete Fitton, Andy Uren, Bob Leeming and Keith Phillips. And those last two, as I mentioned last week, Bob Leeming was a sergeant, had a wife, had a family, had children at home. Uh, and Keith Phillips, who was the same age as me, same first name, uh, who was killed uh, just before the attack on two sisters. And for him, his life just finished there. And when we went back down in 2012, Murder Fraser made a call uh, trying to ensure that as much assistance as possible is given to the families to allow them to go down, and even some who do not recognise the fact that they are entitled to receive a medal on uh, their um, son, brother, father's uh, behalf. So while we reflect on the events of the Falklands conflict and our ties with the communities involved, we have to take a moment to recognise and remember all those who lost their lives or were otherwise, otherwise impacted by the war and the occupation of the islands. We do have quite recently a council leader in the Highlands who actually was resident in the Falklands at the time. So again, that goes to the links that we have between the two countries. But it's also important we acknowledge the lasting impact that can be experienced by some members of the armed forces communities, and we continue to see, try to address that. I, I would just like to finish by expressing my gratitude uh, to the close-knit charity sector that we have here in Scotland. I am sure I speak for everyone today when I say I am continually impressed by the level and quality of support they provide to our ex-service personnel and their families. Uh, and I extend my heartfelt thanks to everyone who supports these charities in whatever way they can. And finally, we will not forget uh, the brave souls who paid the ultimate price to ensure that the Falcons had the ability to exercise their right to self-determination. That is the crucial point. And just to finish on the point, the exchange between uh, Christine Graham and Murdo Fraser, and Sarah Boyer is quite right to say this is the stuff of democracy. We don't have to agree on these things. And sometimes people think that all members of the armed forces or veterans have got the same view on these things. When we have fought wars in the past, it's usually been to protect democratic freedoms, and that means disagreeing. I would just say that I think the way the war was conducted and much that I've learnt about gives me a, a certain degree of anguish about uh, how things could have been conducted differently, and that is probably true uh, of any conflict that there has been. 
But the idea, once those forces, Argentinian forces, representing a fascist regime, were on the islands, that it was going to be necessary to forcibly eject them, I have no trouble with that. I, I think that is, is right. And the principle is, to me, self-determination. You have to allow the people in the Falklands. It wasn't reclaiming them for the UK. It was reclaiming them for the Falkland Islanders to have the choice to, to make their own decision, which, of course, they did subsequently uh, in a referendum. And I think that's something that we all want to, uh, I would imagine, and I, I hate to say that everyone has the same view of these, of these things. When people look back, they think that is what they were fighting for. Although, in truth, most people in the armed forces will tell you that they're fighting for the person next to them and the unit that they belong to as much as anything else. So thank you for everyone that's been involved in the debate and thank you again to Sharon Dow for making sure that this is not forgotten and it will continue to remember those who served in the Falcons uh, in future years. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate and I suspend this meeting until 2 p.m.